Welcome viewers to International Human Rights Law. By and large, this is a quite broad course and it is very important. We get to engage with all the elements and the basics of human rights law in such a manner that we can uh, as well claim that we have the knowledge of it and we can as well apply it and use it for our profession, but also for those who are taking examination of human rights law. It is very critical to begin in earnest with this part of the discussion. The part we are concerned with today is the legal infrastructure of the international human rights law, also known as the treaty bodies, as well as the mechanisms that uh, cater for its enforcement, but also implementation. We must admit that uh, given that we have had the definition, the nature, the characteristics, the typology, but also the philosophy behind human rights, it is necessary also to battle with the question of who has those rights and who should put such claims and uh, who is the duty bearer or who is supposed to respond to such claims whenever they occur. Let us look at it this way. We begin by looking at the learning objectives. This is the guiding point for this lecture today. First and foremost, we need to appreciate the entire development and the progress of the whatever has been done under the auspices of the United Nations civil society and the individual state members and many intergovernmental organizations with international recognition, or rather the members of the international community. Another objective is to understand and appreciate the contributions of human rights law, its jurisprudence, its significance, and what it caters for. That is why I invited you to imagine a world without human rights and a world with human rights and see the difference. Objective number three is to familiarize yourselves with the very critical concepts of human rights law, the theory, the practice, and its application in the profession and the services of law. The legal service providers must be informed of such concepts and terminologies that form the basis of human rights law. This one comes from recommended readings and there are these recommended readings and you can see them within the box. Remember I said repeatedly, read outside the box, but if you can read also without the box. This is to help you grapple with the huge literature around human rights law, international human rights law, its jurisprudence, its case law, and the bulky part of its theory, and try also to sketch it out, looking at the contemporary emerging issues, and remember to be critical. Being critical doesn't mean that you need to oppose everything, but it needs you to be proactive. Look at the advocacy that surrounds human rights law, the entities, the organizations, and also the mechanisms that have been put in place. This moves us immediately to consider the judicial and political wings of human rights uh, within the United Nations, the institutions in place, the treaty bodies, and the processes that we need to grapple with. This is taking us to the reality of the treaty bodies. Treaty bodies are created within the nine core fundamental legal instruments 
those are the treaties that have been designated by the United Nations as very key and core to our learning of human rights law. There are committees that can run from membership of 10 to 20 members that are elected by the United Nations General Assembly, which is the political organ of the United Nations. In this case, they have the mandate, they have their functions, and they have their duties within the provisions of the committee. The committee acts as a quasi-judicial body that has got two processes. The first process is that of reporting process in which every contracting party within that relevant treaty must provide or must submit annual report on its performance and challenges to the concerned committee. The committee can as well provide its own observations and make recommendation in a resolution, which is not legally binding though, but makes very significant remarks and comments on the performance of the contracting party. And uh, it can come as having acted in good faith or having acted in bad faith. All these can have implications on the international relations, but it can also have significant impact on the political relations of the contracting party with other contracting parties. It is something to do with the diplomatic relations that can be badly affected if it comes to a conclusion that the contracting party acted in bad faith. The other process that is very significant is that of the individual complaint, which also comes with special procedure, which is elaborated in optional protocol, as we shall see very soon uh, with those protocols as listed. And this also takes into account the individual possibility to submit or to take matters, allegations or violations of such rights to the specific or the specified treaty body. But before this is taken into consideration, there are two stages that we need to grapple with. The first stage, the admissibility. Is this kind of allegation admissible at the treaty body, at the committee? Uh, has the complainant uh, complied with the rules? Or have all the local remedies been exhausted by the complainant? If all this is established, then the committee has got another stage. The stage here is known as the merit stage. Does the allegation brought before the treaty body meet the threshold of merits? Is it merited? Are those violations genuine and within the powers of that particular treaty? These are the things that must be first and foremost verified and established by the treaty body. Then the treaty body can proceed to give the hearing to the complainant. And this one will end up with the conclusion. And the conclusion of the decision of the treaty body here is not legally binding, but can have significant political and diplomatic repercussions on the duty bearer, and in this case, on the contracting party. This is how it works, and such resolutions and recommendations or documents carrying or, or, or containing the recommendations of the treaty body can as well be presented before another relevant and competent judicial authority, that is the Human Rights Court. 
This is uh, very important for us, and uh, this is also to be understood as not legally binding, but has got political and diplomatic impacts. And we need uh, here to come up with the understanding of the work of the Human Rights Council that was established in 2006 in Geneva. It replaced, of course, Human Rights Commission that was created in 1946. But due to different challenges and changes in time, remember this is the time that followed the war on international terrorism declared by the United States of America and the war in Afghanistan followed by the war of aggression on Iraq. And all these wars came with a lot of violations of human rights that we cannot take for granted and uh, unprecedented kind of use of hostility and atrocities that brought about the need to have the Human Rights Council to deal appropriately with the emerging issues in a way that would make the implementation and enforcement of the treaty bodies and the treaties, as well as the rules of human rights, more effective and efficient. This one brings us to a closer concern dealing with the work of HRC. Remember, we talked about treaty bodies. These are committees within the treaties of human rights and treaty bodies have got their function and mandate within the treaty. And the membership is elected by the United Nations General Assembly. Equally, we can apply the same to the Human Rights Council of 47 members. And such members can as well be suspended if the body is convinced that that member has grossly violated human rights and has gone against its commitment within the treaty and has not observed strictly its international obligations. The example is Libya in 2011. This one takes us to considering the functions of HRC, which sits in Geneva and it meets three times per year, unless there is a call for extraordinary meeting. But the regular session's agenda consists of such issues as periodical review of human rights performance by state parties. Well, this is helping us again to see that the HRC comes up with resolution at the end of its review. But also this is enabling us to get to understand how HRC is holding its sessions. And it is, uh, there is one that is known as UPR, that is Universal Periodic Review, which of course must commit the council in uh, verifications, in uh, observations. But uh, in order to do this, HRC appoints special rapporteur for each country or for each contracting state member whose work is to be answerable to the HRC. And that person must have high level of competence, but also reputation in line of the knowledge and the work of human rights. In that case, special rapporteurs are meant to report to the, to the, to the council on a periodic basis on the performance of the country when it comes to the observations, the respect of the obligations by that particular state. For instance, if there are cases of uh, 
extrajudicial killing, for instance, cases of torture, cases of discrimination, just to give you the example, or cases of genocide, or other cases that are covered within the treaty bodies, then the special rapporteur is the one to document it and provide documentary evidence for the consideration of the council. The council also can appoint a group of experts to carry out certain or to induct certain investigations into an alleged kind of violations of human rights, such as war crimes or crimes against humanity, or to be specific, some particular crimes on populations that requires close attention of HRC before HRC takes into account the need to invite or to summon the concerned party under evaluation. And this one always is conducted in the atmosphere that is very diplomatic, uh, that involves conversations and debates, and also receiving and giving, give and take in a manner that there is what we call complementarity. That means HRC seeks also to build the strength of the contracting party by hearing and listening to the allegations, but also the defense in a manner that the resolution that comes thereafter would be very persuasive and convincing on both parties. In this case, we need to know that such resolutions may have political and kind of moral impacts on the parties. This brings us to our learning outcomes. Our take home number one is that international human rights law is highly institutionalized component of public international law. There's no doubt about that. Number two, contracting parties are by treaty under obligations to respect and promote that particular treaty. And that is the common article one of these treaties. Then uh, take away number three, IHRL, rights on the diplomatic parameters in order to implement its activities. This is one of the mechanisms of the enforcement of the treaties at international level, regional level, as well as at the domestic level. Number four, IHRL is an institution in itself, as we can see. That is, it has also its judicial component. That is, its body that deals with justice system, how justice should be understood from or should be given. One can uh, perhaps take the matters to the international human rights courts or to the regional human rights courts or to national and domestic uh, justice system that is the human rights division in various courts in different countries. This is helping us to engage appropriately with the number six, which is the domestication process. We have seen that IHRL is international body that operates at three levels. The international level that is seen to be within the auspices or it is micromanaged by the United Nations and its agencies, as well as the UN system. Then the second level is the regionalism, the regional organizations like AU or the African Court of Justice and Human Rights, as well as the EU, that is the European Council, the European Court of Human Rights that has generated so much literature in terms of the jurisprudence and so much to learn from the European Court. 
Then we have the Organization of the American States, that is Inter-American Human Rights uh, Declaration, in which we see also court operating and receiving, admitting cases before it for adjudication and determinations. This is how human rights jurisprudence is being built around the treaty bodies, the Human Rights Council, as well as the mechanisms or parameters that have been put in place. This is the legal infrastructure without which it would be a bit less to claim a better understanding of the international human rights law. I invite you once again to share this video with your friends, colleagues, comrades, and uh, people you trust, because what it entails is indeed very important. This one shall move us to the next presentation. Bye for now, and thank you for being here.